Thank you for joining us this morning for this webinar on Ethernet Global Data. Uh, the presentation itself is roughly about 20 minutes or so, and if you have any questions, we'll get to those at the end. Feel free to put them in at any point during the webinar, and we'll get to them then. Okay, let's get going. Welcome to today's tutorial. Let's get started. Here's our agenda for today. Today we're looking at Ethernet Global Data. First, we'll look at what is Ethernet Global Data. Then we'll do a comparison between Ethernet Global Data, Modbus TCP, and Ethernet IP. Then we'll talk about when you should use Ethernet Global Data, or for short, EGD. Then we'll cover configuration. We'll have example applications and demonstrations, and then we'll finish with a Q&A session. So what is the Ethernet Global Data Protocol? Ethernet Global Data is one of the native industrial Ethernet protocols that's available in every OCS that features an Ethernet port. It utilizes UDP for messaging, which is a type of messaging that uses Internet Protocol, or IP. We'll cover that in more detail in the coming slides. Overall, Ethernet Global Data is a great protocol for distributed control applications where you have more than one controller. Now let's compare Ethernet Global Data with Modbus TCP and Ethernet IP, which are other protocols you're probably familiar with. Let's start with TCP Modbus. Modbus TCP is a client-server protocol and it utilizes TCP IP. TCP, as you know, is great for interoperability between multiple manufacturers' products. Now let's compare that with Ethernet IP. Ethernet IP includes both TCP and UDP message types. For I.O. type data, Ethernet IP uses UDP, just like Ethernet global data does. For exchanging logic data tags from logic CPUs, it utilizes TCP IP. If you need an OCS controller to interoperate with Rockwell PLCs, Ethernet IP is a great choice. Now let's look at TCP versus UDP in more detail. Remember, Ethernet global data uses UDP. TCP is a connection-based protocol where series of messages are exchanged between nodes to establish a connection. There's also error recovery built in. Both of those things result in higher bandwidth requirements, and that makes it slower to utilize TCP for your transmission. UDP, on the other hand, which stands for User Datagram Protocol, is a connectionless protocol. Here, error recovery is the responsibility of the receiving device, so it's not built in. As a result of those features, it has lower bandwidth requirements and it's faster. Ethernet Global Data uses UDP, so you can tell from this comparison that it offers good performance with lower bandwidth usage, but there's some error recovery that you'll have to handle that is not handled by the protocol. So when would you use Ethernet Global Data? One situation is when a pole response protocol like Modbus TCP is impractical or too slow. For example, if your device needs to communicate with many server type devices. Another situation when EGD is useful is when you're using multiple controllers in a distributed control environment and they need to share data, sometimes large chunks of data, quickly. Let's look at how that works. With EGD, controllers produce or send and consume or receive what are called exchanges. You can think of those like an envelope. An exchange needs to be configured for where the data is to be sent or its destination, where the data is going to be sent from or the source, and how often the data is going to be sent and received. It must also be configured for what data is going to be inside the envelope, which is called the range. An exchange can be sent to one recipient, which is a unicast, or to multiple recipients, which is called a multicast. Configuration is required on both the produce and the consume side. Now let's look at configuration and how we set EGD up. First, we typically configure the produce side that's sending the data. For that, first you configure the exchange for that produce data. You have to assign an exchange number between 1 and about 16,000. Most applications just have a few exchanges. Then, we need to assign who we're sending that exchange to. If we're sending it to a single device, we'll assign an IP address. If we're sending it to a group of devices, we'll assign what's called a group ID, which is a number between 1 and 32. Then we have to assign how often we'll produce or send the data in milliseconds. Once configured, now we have to put data inside the exchange envelope. So in Seascape, we have a pull-down list of what can go inside the envelope. In my examples today, I'll be using register-based logic, but it works fine with variable-based logic too. 
So here we select data as the type and then we set the starting address and the number of registers that we want to put inside the envelope. We can put multiple blocks of data consecutively inside the exchange envelope to a limit of 1400 bytes of data per exchange. Then we assign a local produce status register to tell us that the data is going out. But that data is not going to be sent out over the wire. Every device that's consuming the data is going to have their own status information that they'll handle on their own. Next we have to configure the consumed side of the exchange. First we must set the exchange number to match the exchange number that was assigned on the produce side. We also have to set the IP address of the producer. If it's a multicast type message to a group, we also have to set the group ID matching the one on the produce side. Then we assign a message timeout. This is not the same number of milliseconds that was assigned on the produce side. Then we must configure what we'll do with the data that comes in. We'll take the data and move it into our local register space of the consuming OCS. And it doesn't have to be the same register numbers that they were put in on the produced side. Next we'll assign a status register so that we can tell if communications are working properly. If it's not you can take corrective action. And then as an option if you want you can also map in the timestamp of when that message was transmitted and you can map that data into a local variable. Here are the details on what you get in your status register both on the produce side and the consume side. On the produce side the only information is everything's working normally which is status 1 or there's no link or the ethernet is down which is status 2. On the consume side similarly you have everything's working normally and no link or ethernet is down but in addition to that if the timeout you set is exceeded but the data still comes in then it's known as tardy which would be status 7. If the data doesn't come in at all and your timeout expires, then it's overdue, which is status 6. If you have status 2 or 6, then you have an issue and you need to take corrective action. Now let's begin our demo where we'll look at that configuration in Seascape. So I'll go into Seascape, and the first thing I did was create a new file, and I'm using register-based logic. I'll start by going into hardware configuration and then LAN1 config. It works on both LAN 1 and LAN 2 if you have an XL7 or an EXL10 or an XL Plus for instance. If you're going to use Ethernet Global Data you need to make sure that Ethernet is set up the way you want in terms of IP address, net mask, etc. And then to set up EGD you just select it here on the list of resident protocols and hit configure selected protocol. We'll start by configuring our exchanges. So let's add an exchange. Remember, think of it as an envelope. The exchange must have a number between 1 and about 16,000. I'll just set it to 1. Then I need to decide am I sending it to an IP address of a single node or am I sending it to a group. Let's say I'm sending it to a group. I have to assign a group ID between 1 and 32. And I'll set that to 1. Then I'll input how often I want to produce the data. And I'll send that out every 10 milliseconds. So I've configured the exchange envelope, but now I need to put data inside of it. So I'll make sure the exchange is highlighted and I'll hit add range. Our choices are data and status. We'll look at status later. Then I input the address I want to start at. Let's say we want to start at register 1 and we want 100 registers. So we're putting 100 words in R1 through R100 in the envelope. Next, let's say I want some bit type data and we'll start at percent %M193 and we'll put in 64 bits. This needs to be on a word boundary, so I selected M193. Now, again, I'll hit add range and this time I'll add status. I'll say register 200 is going to be the status register for my produced data. That's the configuration on the produced side complete. To configure the consumed end of this exchange, I need to go to another Seascape project because this data is going to be received by a different OCS. So I'll open another new file. Again, I'm using register-based logic. Going back into hardware configuration, this consuming OCS still has a requirement of having a full Ethernet configuration. I'll select EGD and I'll hit Configure Selected Protocol. First, I'll configure the consumed side of the exchange. I'll hit add exchange. My exchange number needs to match what I configured on the production side. So I'll set that to 1. Next I need to configure the IP address of the producer. 
So let's say that this is the IP address. I could assign a variable here, and this doesn't have to be hard coded. This is coming to a group, so that must be configured, and we assigned group 1. Now I have to set a timeout. It's sent every 10 milliseconds, so let's set this to 25 milliseconds. It will still come in every 10 milliseconds, but it's not going to be late until it takes longer than 25 milliseconds to arrive. That's my consumed exchange complete. Now let's add a range of data. There were 100 words of registered data, so I'll map those in, and I can map them into an independent location in memory. I'll map that into R100 locally, and now I'll add those bit types, and I'll put them right at the very beginning. Again, we have 64 bits. Then let's add status because it's important that we have status on the receiving side especially. That'll tell us the data we're expecting did not arrive. Next, let's look at an example application where you could use Ethernet global data. Let's say we have an assembly plant where we're assembling some sort of relatively small product. We're assembling it on a cart and we have 16 carts overall. There are multiple assembly stations and the cart will move from station to station as a different part is added to the assembly. Each cart is battery operated and is controlled locally by an XL4. Then an XL7 is coordinating the movements of the carts on the assembly line. Why would we use Ethernet global data here? Well if we used Modbus TCP for example, the XL7 that's communicating with the carts would have to pull each of the cart XL4s one at a time to get information. With Ethernet Global Data, we can overcome that limitation because it would allow the XL7 to send multicast data to all the CART XL4s with a single message. Those CARTs could take the data they need out of that and use it for their own local purposes. Now for status coming back the other direction, each CART on a periodic basis could send out a single message that would be consumed by the XL7 providing status information. Depending on the available bandwidth, update rates less than 100 milliseconds are completely practical. Let's map out the data and see what that looks like. Starting with our coordinator XL7, the command data is sent out to all the carts, and then every cart is going to receive that message of data every 100 milliseconds, and using some logic it will only use the data it cares about. Every cart will have some common command data that it will store in register 1 for example, which is data that all the carts care about. And then it'll have another bank of registers that are individual commands that are specifically targeted for that particular cart. Next, let's look at data coming in the other direction. Every cart is sending status to the network as a single exchange. Then the coordinator XL7 is receiving that status information through 16 different exchanges and mapping that information. Now let's look at that configuration starting at the coordinator side for the data going from the coordinator to the XL4s. It's basically you have a single multicast type exchange where you're sending out a single bank of data that's going to be received by the carts. And then that same coordinator on the consumed side will have 16 consumed exchanges that have to be configured one per cart. On the cart side of things each cart is going to be consuming just one bank of data. And then, through logic, it'll pull out only the data it cares about. Each cart will also be producing one message which has status information that will be sent back to the coordinator. Now, I'll show you how to implement that application in Seascape. Let's start by looking at the configuration of our coordinator. Again, we're going into our Ethernet configuration, selecting EGD and configuring that. On the production side of things, we're sending for exchange number one, and we're broadcasting this to a group. We're sending it out every 50 milliseconds. That is the frequency of the data that's being produced. Here's the data we're sending. We have 72 registers, eight registers that all the carts care about, and then an additional four registers per cart that are specific instructions from the coordinator to each specific cart. After that, we have a status register to tell us if everything's working normally. Now let's look at the consumed side at the coordinator level. This is the data that's coming in from the cart XL4s. We have 16 exchanges that have been configured, one per cart. Here's the unique exchange numbers from the ID of the cart that's sending the information. It does not have a group ID affiliated with it, and we've set a timeout for receiving the data at 100 milliseconds.
the data coming in is just the four words from each cart and the status information from the carts. Now let's look at the cart side. I want a single logic program that's used by all the carts so we don't have 16 different programs to maintain. So first let's start at the EGD configuration. I'll go into LAN1 config. Here first I made sure that my IP address is sourced from a register. This will help allow one program to be used by every cart by having a configurable IP address. Now let's look at the EGD configuration. Let's start with the data being consumed from the coordinator. We're bringing the first eight words into a set bank of registers starting at R1. Those are the eight words of command data from the coordinator that are important to every cart. The next 64 words has all the data going to all the carts, four words per cart. We're receiving it all, but in logic, we'll pull out the four words of data that are meant for this cart. And then for the data that's being produced by each cart, there's four words of status information data that each cart is sending back to the coordinator. Also, if I go into my exchange, you'll notice that I didn't put an exchange number here for the produced data for each cart. I put a register instead. That can then vary depending on the ID of the cart that I'm on. If I'm cart number one, I need to produce my data under exchange number two and so on. So now let's go to that logic. This logic will ensure that the appropriate IP address is configured, that the appropriate exchange numbers are configured, etc. so that I can pull out the specific data intended for each cart. Let's start with the IP address configuration. In this case, it's a fixed IP configuration, but the last number in the IP address varies depending on the cart number. This is where we set the variability for that last number. So the IP address of each cart is going to be somewhere between 201 and 216, depending on the cart number. So we basically add 200 to the cart number to get that last number of the IP address. Here, the first three octets are fixed. For the EGD exchange number for the data we're producing back to the coordinator, we're just adding one to our cart number. So if I'm cart number one, I send my data back in exchange number two. If I'm cart number 7, I send my data back in exchange number 8. Down here is where we're going to pull out the four words of data coming from the coordinator that's specific to each cart. So first I calculate an offset. Remember, this data all came in starting at register 501. I calculate an offset so that I can perform an indirect move and move the right four words into the local register that receives in the data coming from the coordinator for use in the logic program. Now let's see quickly what that could look like on the OCS. Here I created an example of a network setup screen on one of these XL4s that's running a cart to show how we could change the cart number and modify the IP address as well as the produced exchange number for the data that we're sending back to the coordinator. So with cart number one, my produced exchange number is two and my IP address ends in 201. If I'm cart number two, my exchange number increments, so that's the register that I set inside my EGD configuration for that produced exchange. Also, my IP address changes. If I'm cart number 16, you can see my exchange number and my IP address changing as well. So that's the end of our demonstration. Thank you for joining me for today's tutorial and the Q&A session will begin shortly. Okay, we'll see if we've got anything in on that. Not just yet. So we'll go back to my screen. Um, so you should all be seeing my screen right now. Next week, we do have IO tips and tricks for the micro series, followed by WebMI with the micro series, and then into some Agor variable based um, webinars on Modbus TCP and creating and editing and that will take us up to the end of the month um, as usual all the all the previous ones can be found underneath so if you ever need to refer back to something they're always going to be there um, i'll do one last check on the question panel i'm not seeing anything uh, thank you for joining us this morning so and we hope to see you again next week goodbye